Hello everyone, I'm Keshak uh, and today I'm going to speak uh, about real-time personalization with Antic and Spotify. Uh, the talk is mostly going to focus, uh, I'll start out by you know, giving you a brief overview of what Spotify is all about, I'll give you a brief introduction about monetization product uh, at Spotify, and then I'll dive deep into one of the use cases that we're trying to solve uh, using real-time personalization uh, to optimize user experience uh, you know, on our platform. So before I begin, uh, let me introduce myself briefly. Uh, I've been at Spotify since 2011, and I tend to focus uh, mostly on data and backend engineering problems, uh, working with the monetization team here. And recently, I've been focusing a lot on targeting infrastructure and uh, the, the, the ads personalization piece, and, and you know, mainly uh, the real-time aspects of it, because that's really interesting. So since you guys are here, I'm assuming you know what Spotify is. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Spotify is, uh, we are a digital music streaming company. We started in 2006, and as of today, we are available in 56 markets, uh, which is uh, 56 countries. We have a catalog of over 20 million songs, uh, and we it's, it's not a static catalog. We almost add 20,000 songs daily to that catalog, so it's an ever-increasing size of catalog. Uh, we have over 24 million users, uh, and those are active users, not just registered users. Uh, and of those 24 million users, uh, about 6 million users, or over 6 million users, are paying subscribers. Uh, we also have very uh, in a highly engaged user base, uh, and those users have created over a billion and a half playlists on our platform. So let me start by giving you a high level overview of uh, the monetization uh, strategy or product at Spotify. At, at Spotify, we don't not only generate a lot of revenue uh, through you know, our uh, freemium model, and, and that model is basically uh, uh, a two-tier sort of, you know, uh, business model. We have a free uh, uh, music streaming tier where basically the ads uh, pay for all the music that gets consumed. And then there's a premium tier where the users uh, pay a you know, fixed monthly fee to access uh, our service with uh, you know, ads-free experience. At the same time, they also get some premium features like Spotify Connect, which is sort of like uh, AirPlay. And then you know, there, are, there are things like offline music access and, and so on and so forth. So through our monetization strategy, we have not only generated a lot of revenue, but as of today, we've paid over a billion dollars back, back to the, the rights holders of music. Uh, in our user base, uh, one out of every four user is, uh, users is a paying subscriber, which means about 75% of our users are using the free tier and they see uh, you know, ads on, uh, on their clients. Uh, in addition to these things, based on our uh, you know, uh, strategy, we also see our platform uh, as, you know, uh, uh, as, a, as a platform which will help uh, artists um, and music labels promote their content. So it's not only a platform for delivering ads, but it's also uh, a platform for delivering album promotions and a bunch of other interesting ads, which, which I'll talk about later in my talk. So what's, what's our mission? Uh, uh, the overarching mission that, that we're working towards is to power the free tier with ads that the customers love. Uh, and tactically, this translates into two, two you know, sub-missions or goals. Uh, one of them is delighting users, brands, and artists with standard promotional experiences. And secondly, delivering the right kind of ad messages to users at all time. Uh, if you notice, uh, in the first uh, sub-mission, or sort of like the goal, uh, we focus on giving the best experience, uh, not only to the brands, for sending across their message, but also making sure that the user are really, users are really engaged and they are delighted by the promotion experiences. At the same time, artists and music labels can uh, promote their content and be uh, and use and make, make the most of our advertisement platform. So to actually uh, you know work towards this mission, we realize we need to introduce new ad formats uh, which abide by these four you know, guiding principles. Uh, the first of them is we should have native ads. What that means is our ad content should look uh, very native to the platform. It should feel like any other content. It shouldn't have a jagged experience for our users. Secondly, our ads need to be actionable. So users should be able to do things with our ads. They should be able to just follow a playlist or click an ad or 
uh, try and skip an ad and then do a bunch of things which makes them uh, you know, more involved with the messaging. Uh, at the same time, we want to ensure that we don't be very complicated ads so that they cannot scale, so ads need to be scalable. And lastly, and, and what one of the most important things that we focus on is to make sure that our ads are engaging. So once users are shown an ad, they should be able to do things with it. So for instance, if it's a video ad, they should be able to rotate the screen uh, and then watch you know, ad in different aspect uh, ratio, or they should be able to play uh, music right away when they see a legal promotion ad. So let me give you some examples of few ad formats that we've experimented with, and, and some of these are live today. Uh, this one is called uh, Spotlight. Uh, this ad format gets used by um, uh, the label relations team that we have here, who work closely with music labels. And they're using this ad format for uh, helping users discover new kind of music and new content. Uh, so if, if you think about those four principles I uh, talked about, you can see that this ad format is very native. It doesn't feel like an ad. It almost feels like any other content on a platform. It's also very actionable. So right, right there in the ad, you can follow that playlist. You can literally start streaming music by hitting the play button. Uh, it's scalable because the specifications of these, uh, this particular ad is very simple, <coughs> complete for it, and it's not very difficult to generate this content. And lastly, it's engaging because user can actually consume music uh, by you know taking some action on, on this ad. So they really uh, feel engaged with this uh, this kind of ad format. And in future, if we show new ads in the same format, they'll probably you know take an action on it as well. Uh, something similar, but but not quite, is uh, what we call an album promotion. Uh, this is you know an album promotion for uh, an a new album uh, from an artist. So this is a way of you know, actually promoting their content. So we want to see, we want to make sure that the artists and music labels, uh, you know, also get an opportunity to use our ad platform for promoting their content and deliver their message. Uh, this is another format which we call sponsored genre, and it's sort of it solves a different use case. So the first two ads were tailored towards uh, you know music labels. This one is tailored towards uh, brands. So here, there's a genre uh, on a browse page, which is called Happiness, and it's been sponsored by Coca-Cola, who's one of our premium partners. And if you look at it, uh, you know Coca-Cola wants to be as associated with this mood of happiness and wants to be engaged, uh, or rather have, have an audience who's engaged with the content of the platform. So we've used this format uh, to make sure that the ads are not jarring and they're not too loud, and uh, at the same time, the brand can interact with the audience and uh, measure uh, the engagement through a bunch of actions that they can take on this app. Uh, for instance, you know, if they start streaming a lot of content, a lot of tracks from this playlist, we know that they sort of associate Coca-Cola brand with happiness mode. So this sort of solves the first mission that I talked about, which was making sure that our uh, users, brands, and artists are actually delighted with the experiences. But if all these app formats are not necessarily delivered at the right time, then we can create uh, hell. As you can see uh, in all these, uh, uh, you know, uh, messages that our users sent us, we definitely don't have a very happy audience. Uh, uh, during the Christmas of 2012, a lot of our users complained that we were <laughs> delivering them inappropriate ads when they were in a session uh, listening to Christmas music with their uh, kids around them. And this was definitely not uh, you know, the right message for the right moment, or that particular moment. So uh, this was definitely a problem that we had in our platform, because you know, ads were, uh, sort of uh, optimization or relevancy was not one of the, the high priorities for us uh, back in the day, because we're still growing our business. And uh, we didn't have such a big um, free user base. Most of our users were still premium users. So now it's been a new focus for our, uh, for our company to make sure that we fix these kind of problems. And that's where the, you know, the interesting challenging problems lie. So when we saw that we had these kind of problems, we went back to the drawing board and I tried to figure out what are the things that we need to do to solve uh, for that specific uh, use case of the uh, right message for every moment. The few things that we came up with were making sure that our ads are context aware. What that means is, making sure that we know um, what's the context of a session that the user is in, what are the kind of music that they're streaming, what are the kind of actions that they're taking on, on the ads, uh, what's 
what's the view in the client that they're focusing on. Based on these kind of things, we get very strong signals to make sure that we deliver the right kind of ads to them. So if we know, for instance, uh, that a user is actually streaming kids' music, we definitely don't want to send them uh, inappropriate ads that we did in the past. Uh, in addition to this, we also want to make sure that we create measurable ad formats. So the ad formats that you saw in um, the previous uh, slides, they have a lot of actions built in, and we can measure those actions, and those give us strong signals about whether users are having a positive response to the ads, or they're trying to avoid the ads. By using these measurements, we can optimize the ad experience, understand the relevancy of ads to certain kind, uh, to all kinds of users, uh, uh, and then figure out you know what class of ads are more relevant to certain users. But on the other side, we also want to make sure that our brands actually understand their audience very well. So we, we wanted to build tools uh, so that the brands can really understand what are the kind of uh, or you know. What are the features of audience that feel engaged with their messaging? Uh, for instance, demographics is, is a very simple one, but also things like, um, for instance, Red Bull would want to figure out what's the genre of music that the sports lover uh, stream, uh, and then based on that, they would want to target those kind of ads to uh, uh, that specific audience. So now that we in future, you know, build like these tools um, so that the brands can understand their audience. We also want to make sure that our targeting infrastructure is really, really uh, flexible, because uh, as the brands understand their audience well, they want to use you know, more granular targeting to reach to their audiences. Uh, so having a targeting infrastructure which can incorporate new new ways of targeting users really helps. And lastly, we want to make sure that we analyze the user behavior on our platform to improve that relevancy uh, and. and example of that is if a user is actually streaming classical music and at that point in time we send a very jarring and loud ad to a user, that would ruin their whole music experience. So we want to make sure that in real time and also in batch mode, uh, we try and understand the musical profile of a user and use that to tailor the ad experience. In all of this, we also have an important learning uh, that a lot of these things ha need to happen in real time. And the reason for that is it's only in real time that we can truly assess the context of a user, like you know, the current view in the client or the last track which was streamed. Uh, it's only in real time that we can actually get an immediate feedback uh, about you know, whether an app was still by a user or not, whether a user actually followed a playlist, and use those kind of uh, signals to uh, optimize the ad delivery in real time. At times, using batch data for understanding musical profiles is really useful. But you can't really act uh, on uh, signals that you're getting in real time based on that kind of analysis. So we do, uh, we definitely do a lot of batch analysis and generate uh, you know, the user profiles, but the real time aspect of it is really the, the, the crux of it and then really crucial. And lastly, uh, by making sure that we have an infrastructure where we can you know, make decisions in real time, we actually increase a lot of ad opportunities. Uh, the canonical example is you know, hyper-local targeting, uh, where a user is probably walking past a uh, Starbucks store and we can actually show a user uh, an ad to redeem an offer. Um, we can also you know, use some of the, the mood data from uh, the metadata that we have about tracks to figure out what's the mood of the user and make sure that we can target ads uh, you know, based on that. There are a bunch of other examples for uh, you know, doing something similar like weather and, and such. So using these learnings, we went back uh, to try and figure out how do we actually then solve the problem of serving the right message for every moment. And the two basic themes that came up were, we need to fix uh, you know, the, the ads, um, bad ads or inappropriate ads problem in the music context. Uh, and for that, we had to do a real-time analysis of like, the short window of user activity, uh, which involves, uh, and then I'll go uh, and talk about uh, some of the details of that in, in um, you know, some of the slides uh, after this. Uh, so using some of the open source technologies, we want to solve that problem. And then there's a problem of uh, improving the ad relevancy based on the user behavior, which involves basically building user profiles in real time and, and updating those profiles in real time, but also doing the batch analysis uh, of, of the longer window of user activity to generate the, the profile for user, uh, for their musical taste, for their uh, you know, ads behavior, and what kind of uh, you know, ad verticals are they more responsive to. 
so since you know these two teams have a lot of specific problems, we wanted to solve for some quick wins and then iterate over those things in, in the future. One of the, you know, the first problems that we saw a lot of complaints about was the, the problem of not having you know ads uh, uh, or inappropriate ads when you know, the kids' music is being streamed. So we wanted to solve that problem. And we also wanted to fix the relevancy of ads in the music context. And that's another problem that we've seen and users have complained about that, where some of our ads are really loud uh, when users are streaming, let's say, classical music or you know some jazz music. And, and that's not necessarily appropriate for that session. And both of those things could be uh, solved in uh, real time in batch mode. So this is like a very simplistic view of our targeting uh, architecture, where uh, the client, whenever there is an ad break, and if, if for those who don't know, uh, we have clients on desktop, mobile devices, and on a browser, uh, which is a web client. So whenever there is an ad break, uh, you know. It, makes a request to the targeting service to get the context uh, about what's, what's the user's uh, context for that moment. Uh, and then once the targeting service returns that context, a uh, client sends that information to an ad server. Uh, the ad server you know, uh, runs its rule engine, tries to figure out the most appropriate app for that moment and delivers that app to the client. Uh, the targeting service, in a very simplistic uh, manner, uh, which has been represented here, talks to a bunch of data stores, and the two key ones are uh, the user registration data store, which has like static data about demographic information of the users that they give up when they're registering on our service. And then there's a more interesting piece, which I'm going to dive deep into, which is the user activity store. This is where we maintain the user profiles, uh, and then store the information about the current genre, the current uh, mood, and a bunch of other activities uh, in real time, and, and some of that activities also computed in batch mode, like the taste profile of a user based on the musical uh, you know, consumption history. So having understood the interaction between the client and the targeting uh, backend, uh, we wanted to make sure that we complete the feedback loop and collect as much information and signals as possible in real time. So uh, we, we have our plans, we generate a lot of, lot of log information and that, the information that they basically capture is the any kind of response to ads, any kind of you know movement uh, based on the views on the client, and, and and the kind of things that are being streamed, the kind of uh, apps within our uh, client which get loaded, all that gets uh, logged, and then we wanted a scalable log collection framework to collect all that logs. We wanted a log processing system which could process uh, those logs. So basically, we need to filter out the messages which are not important, do some aggregation to generate user profiles, and then eventually store that in, in a storage system, uh, a fast storage system, which can actually be looked up during serve time by the targeting service to get the context. And to make some of the decisions about how to fill those boxes uh, for log collection, log processing, and storage, I'm going to talk about some of the, uh, the requirements that we have for those systems. So we wanted our log collection uh, system to be scalable, which meant um, it needs to collect log messages from you know terabytes of data that gets generated. Uh, and I'll get into the numbers in the next slide. So we generate a lot of data in our service uh, services. So there's a lot of service log data. There's a lot of user activity data. Uh, and we need to collect all that data in a scalable fashion, in a reliable fashion, with low latency. We also need capability to process those logs in batch and real-time mode and have a facility uh, to you know, filter out the messages, aggregate, uh, and then basically generate user profile. And we definitely want a storage system which has fast reads uh, so that we can enable serve time lookups and do updates to that user store in real time. Uh, so these are some of the numbers uh, you know, um, based on uh, the, the data that gets generated uh, in our cluster. So, Spotify has been uh, using Hadoop for a long time. Uh, if you see uh, the guy in the picture, this that picture is from, he's one of our engineers. That picture is from 2008. That's our uh, second generation Hadoop cluster back in the days which, which got overheated. Uh, since then, we've definitely you know, improved a lot. Uh, right now we have a 700 node Hadoop cluster in London, uh, and it's probably one of the bigger uh, Hadoop clusters in Europe. Uh, we generate you know, four gigabytes of service logs daily. Uh, uh, 
we have 4.5 terabytes of uncompressed user data which gets generated daily. Uh, and and, we, and the, the processed data which, which gets generated out of Hadoop jobs is about six, 64 terabytes. And we use a bunch of technologies for processing all these data. So we have uh, Yarn supported MapReduce. Uh, we have Apache Jira being used by some of the teams for the graph processing. We use Apache Storm for real-time processing, and that's one of the tools that we, we use for this use case. I'll get into the details of that in a bit. Uh, there are a few teams who are experimenting with Apache Spark for some of the, the near real-time use cases as well. So based on the choices that we have internally, uh, <coughs> and some of that is also you know the open source technologies and some of that is in-house, we figured that to fill those blocks, uh, we are going to use Kafka for log collection. We are going to use either Hadoop or Storm for log processing. And for uh, storage, we are going to use Cassandra or Memcached. So getting specifically into log collection, company-wide, uh, you know, there's a team who actually works on data infrastructure. We, they experimented with both Flume and Kafka uh, for uh, that specific use case. And we results with Kafka, and that's why we ended up choosing Kafka. Uh, for those who don't know what Kafka is, uh, it's, it's a uh, you know, distributed pub sub kind of um, uh, system used for high throughput used used for high throughput applications uh, such as you know log log collection and log delivery, and we use that in our use case. For log processing in batch mode, we use Hadoop quite a lot, and for real time use cases, uh, Apache Storm uh, is being used quite a lot. Uh, Apache Storm is is a relatively new technology. It's been open sourced. Uh, it was developed and open sourced by Twitter. It's it's been out there for about two years now, year and a half to two years. And at Spotify, we've been using it for about seven to eight months. And for a lot of storage, we end up using Cassandra and Memcache internally. For this specific use case uh, of real-time ad targeting, we ended up using Memcache because we didn't care so much about persistence. And uh, most of our data, even if it gets lost, it's, it's OK. And the reads and the writes were really quick. So that sort of worked out best for our, our specific use case. So for those who don't know a lot about Storm, uh, uh, the, the, the in layman's term, it's uh, you know like Hadoop without the HDFS. It's, it's a real-time stream processing framework. It's like MapReduce, uh, but uh, you know with many reducer steps. It's fault tolerant and it gives you you know guaranteed message processing. At Spotify, we've been using Storm for about seven to eight months now. It's been used by a bunch of uh, teams for different applications. We use it for ads. The recommendation team uses it. Analytics and monitoring teams use it. We have a decent sized cluster, not too big. It's still sort of an experimental mode, but we are using it for a lot of production uh, level stuff as well. Uh, and to give you some uh, uh, you know, quick summary of what Storm does, uh, Storm basically, as I said, it's a you know stream, a stream processing framework. Uh, there are two concepts, primary concepts in Storm. Uh, one of them is called a spout which is a source of the message stream. And another one is called a bolt, which is like a processing unit for uh, you know, uh, consuming and processing message streams and you know, doing certain kind of computations. Uh, this whole wiring of spouts and bolts is called a topology. And you can wire them in, in any fashion. So you can see that an input of a spout can go to multiple bolts. And uh, you know multiple bolts can send their output as input to another bolt. Uh, bolts can do any kind of operation. They can do filtration, aggregation. And uh, since um, uh, Storm guarantees, uh, you know, it's very fault tolerant and it guarantees uh, sort of, uh, let me go over that again. It, you know, it's fault tolerant and it, it guarantees message processing. In most cases, you know, if any message that you get ends up being processed. And if some of the, you know, the workers die, it restarts and takes care of a bunch of things. So it really works well for this specific use case. So the use case that I'm going to talk about is using real-time session genre information to control ads running in real time. And we are going to use Storm for processing all the log messages that we get in real time, generate the, the, the profile of users uh, based on the genre uh, and that they're streaming, and then use that uh, in the targeting backend to give the context back to the, the client so that it can fetch the right ad from the ad server. So this is how the flow of things is going to be. So Kafka is going to uh, collect the logs, send it to Storm. Uh, Storm is going to filter out certain messages, aggregate uh, certain kind of messages at a user level. 
store all that user profile information in memcache, which gets read by the targeting backend. And uh, this is almost real-time system, so that's why it's a software real <coughs> system, and it's really easy to scale. So this is how the flow of things is going to be. Uh, so getting into the, the interesting part of how we actually access the data, uh, all the clients at Spotify, they talk to a gateway service, which we call Access Point. Uh, and Access Point generates, um, or rather, uh, Access Points have Kafka producers installed, and they uh, transmit all the client-related log messages to, uh, to Kafka directly. Uh, other services do uh, something similar. But any kind of log message or signal that gets generated in the client comes from Access Point. And we have this system in all our data centers. So we have uh, Kafka producers in all the data centers. What they do is they send a message to the Kafka broker, which eventually sends uh, all the messages to the big Kafka cluster that we have in London uh, uh, data, uh, data center. And we have a consumer which consumes these messages from uh, Kafka broker and uh, sends it to a um, Radu cluster and writes it to HDFS, and some of that, uh, and those messages, messages also get streamed to the Storm cluster. Once we have the messages uh, being streamed to the Storm, Storm cluster, we have a Kafka spout, which is basically the source of the message streams, uh, which starts emitting, uh, you know, the the, me uh, the messages that we, that you've subscribed on. Uh, or subscribe to, to the bolts in this topology. So this is how a general topology looks like. So uh, for this specific example, the log message that we're interested in is called end song, which basically tells you uh, all, the, all the details about um, when a track was streamed. So we are subscribing to end song message uh, in Kafka. Kafka starts uh, streaming those messages uh, and emits the, uh, the doubles to end song filter bolt. The Ensong filter bolt is a simple bolt which uh, basically just extracts the user ID and the track ID uh, from that message and filters out uh, you know, some, of the, some of the log messages uh, for things like if you know, the track was streamed for less than a certain amount of time and if the track was not streamed from the Spotify server, if, if it was a local track and a few other things. After the filtration process, it emits the tuple of user ID and track ID to the metadata bolt. Uh, what this bolt does is it talks to one of the metadata stores, uh, does a lookup based on the track ID, uh, and gets the genre information. So at the, at the at the end of that process, the metadata bolt is emitting uh, a user ID along with the genre. So the message has been translated from a user ID and a track ID to user ID and a genre. Uh, in user genre bolt, we're doing aggregation, and we we have like. Uh, a special in-house least frequency uh, used, you know, uh, cache built in that specific bolt, which uh, figures out which is like the top genre for the user in that session. It computes the the weights based on a moving window of uh, tracks that have been streamed in, the, in their respective genre. And once we've figured out the top genre for users, every once in a while we emit that to a memcache bolt, which is literally an interface to memcache. So all it does is it gets a user ID and their genre and emits that to a memcache, uh, which is that user genre store. So in the earlier diagram where I showed the, the targeting uh, service talking to user activity store, uh, one of those activities is the genre, and that's where the information gets stored. So for this specific use case, uh, this is how we solve uh, the, the problem of um, figuring out the genre in the session and using that as a targeting key value parameter uh, in real time. So having built this, one of the important things was measuring the effectiveness of this new feature. Uh, the way we do that is we build a lot of ad quality scores from lower level metrics, like the number of clicks, obviously, um, and things like you know if someone followed a playlist which was shown in an album promotion, or someone tried to skip an ad, uh, or someone tried to do something which is more direct. But then we also have downstream metrics like uh, any ad, uh, did that affect the number of streams that the user uh, actually uh, had for a particular kind of music? Uh, so the downstream effects is overall engagement of the user. So if the user starts using a platform less than what the user did before consuming certain kind of ads, uh, that's, a, that's a strong signal. In addition to that, things like uh, 
uh, the number of streams for that particular album, which was shown in an album promotion, it's, it's, an, uh, it's a strong signal. In addition to these you know, uh, signals, there are other kind of things uh, which, which we you know, take into account and then try and figure out, you know, more, uh, we classify things as positive responses or the things that user did to avoid an ad. So once we have built this quality score, then we use that uh, to validate certain uh, you know, hypotheses that we have. For example, like do mid-roll ads perform better than pre-roll uh, video ads? And uh, we de design those uh, experiments and evaluate them against those quality scores. Uh, and we also want to make sure, lastly, that we can actually do some of these optimizations in real time uh, to uh, you know, improve uh, the delivery of ads. For instance, if you find that the user is actually uh, you know, trying to avoid a lot of ads in real time, we can uh, make sure that the next app that gets delivered to the user is uh, you know, slightly different. So based on these things, we've we measured the effectiveness and overall we found that a lot of our advertisers are really interested in these kind of targeting features and users have, you know, we've seen slight improvement in, in the way the users respond to these kind of ads. Uh, so this is how like we've solved for one very specific use case, and then there are a bunch of other interesting use cases that we're working uh, on. Uh, overall, at Spotify, the ads mission or the monetization mission has been like a recent uh, mission, and we're trying to solve a lot of challenging problems. One of them is improving the ad relevancy. Uh, some of the problems are you know trying to build segments of audiences uh, to target against, and so on and so forth. So if you really like any of these problems and want to work on on those, do check out our jobs page or you know reach out to me or Lindsay um, after this. Uh, so that's it. Uh, I want to open it up for QA round. Any questions? Sure. Do you use any data from outside of Spotify interactions to do ad optimization or anything like that? So as of today we don't. Uh, but oh uh, sure. So the question was, do we use any third-party data to improve the ads optimization uh, within Spotify? So as of today, we don't. But uh, we recently acquired a company called Econist, which does a lot of music intelligence. And they have a lot of data from the web. They, they mine the, you know, they scrape the web and, and mine a lot of that data. So potentially, we can start using some of that going forward, uh, since they're part of Spotify now. But we're not uh, actively using anything uh, from third-party sources. More questions? Sure. Uh, you said you're able to optimize delivery of the ads based on these different criteria that you listed. Um, now, your ad server is, is, is this DFP? Uh, yeah, it's, it's so partly DFP. We are doing the transition, but for most of these problems, we are using DFP. Okay, and you're able to have DFP. Uh, put that logic within DFP, maybe you can just talk to that a little bit, or is that through sure. their APIs, or how do, how do you? So some of the things is, uh, you know, we can, you know, blacklist certain kind of ads based on, it's, it's a trafficking thing, so for instance, we know that certain kind of ads, if we don't want to, you know, show those ads, for instance, if the genre of uh, a user in that session is a kid's music. So using some of those techniques, you can really avoid serving those kind of ads. So. Uh, you know, some of those problems can be solved by trafficking, but you want to make sure that you send the right kind of key value parameters uh, in the, the ad call to a DFP. Any more questions? Cool, thanks.